later. Okay, it is now recording, so just be aware of that. Okay, so again, what we're doing is here, we've got this company that's receiving potatoes from a producer or supplier. 500 potatoes were in the truck. Oh, I'm sorry, they sampled 500 potatoes from the truck. 47 of them were bad. If we divide that, we get 9.4%. The question is, does this mean we should reject the load of potato chips? So we're going to start off by saying this. Let P equal the true proportion of chips that are defective. So there's this true proportion of somewhere out there. If we had the time, we'd inspect every single potato that this company is going to send us. We just don't have time to do that. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to inspect just 500 of them and see how they look, see what's happening. Okay, so we're going to have something called HO. This is called the null hypothesis. And if you've taken statistics before in the past, you've heard that word, null hypothesis. It is a statement that sort of means everything is okay, that you know we're not in trouble, so to speak. In this case, this company is worried that if there are more than 8% of the potatoes or potato chips are bad, right here it says more than 8%, they're going to have to reject that load of potatoes from the supplier. So HO then is going to be that P, the proportion of potato chips that are okay, is that have blemishes, I'm sorry, are less than or equal to 0.08. In other words, HO is saying we're going to accept this load of potato chips. And then for HA, that's called the alternate hypothesis. And usually the alternate hypothesis is something that you're worried about. In this case, we're worried that the proportion of potato chips that are bad is greater than 0.08. So every hypothesis test starts off that way where you write down an HO and an HA, a no hypothesis and a alternative hypothesis. Okay, once you've done this, now we're ready. So the next thing, here we go. We're gonna start to figure out if our p hat, our sample proportion, which was 47 out of 500, or 0.094, proves to us that we should reject this load of potato chips. So here's what you do next. You draw a picture. Draw the normal distribution here. In the middle, we're going to put HO, whatever HO says. In this case, it's that p equals 0.08. So you always put HO in the middle, right? And then we're gonna go out over here and we're gonna mark off our P hat. And our P hat in this case is 0.094 and draw a vertical line, okay? So let me pause for a minute. Any questions yet or so far about any of this? Okay, so once we've done this, the next question is we have to do some kind of shading. So make a note, we shade according to HA. So we go back to HA, you'll notice that HA has the greater than symbol in it. So that means we're gonna shade above that space. Okay, so now that you've done that, your job is to find, find this area, that's what we need to do. We need to know what this area is. And actually as a name, we call it a p-value. So that's that area is something called a p-value and we have to find it. So um, the way we've been finding area under normal curves has been to use a z-score. So if you remember, we use a z-table like this. And if we go down, here's the z-table. We did some problems with it. It's here, but it always gives you area to the left. So we need to remember that and be careful. We do one minus sometimes to find the area we really want. 
but that's the gist of it. That's what we have to do. Okay. So the question is, how do we get a z-score? Like, how do we get this? So there's a formula for it. In a one proportion z-test, which is what this is, one proportion, because we were just picking one sample of 500 potatoes and finding out what percent of them is bad. Um, the way you do this is you find a z-score by doing this. p hat minus p over the square root of p times one minus p over n, where n is the sample size. Okay, so let's plug in everything we have. So p hat, we already did, that's 0 0.094 minus p. So this p here, it comes from HO. So that's 0 0.08. And divided by the square root, and then we have the 0 0.08 times 1 minus 0 0.08 is 0.92 over 500. So z equals something. We're going to have to do all this math here. So here, I'll do a little bit of it. I'll do it a little bit at a time for you. So you can, you can see this, ready? So on the top, you're going to subtract those things, the 0 0.094 minus the 0 0.08 and you get 0 0.014 divided by on the bottom, it's a little more complicated, do the square root of 0 0.08 times 0.92 divided by 500. And if you do that correctly, you get 0 0.012. And so if I divide those numbers, 0 0.014 divided by 0 0.012, you end up getting 1.17. So that's what we're getting for a z-score, all right? So that means z equals 1.17 goes with this vertical line, and I want the area above that. So let's go back to the chart. We haven't used this chart in a while, so so serve as a little review for us. So here's the, here's the table. We need to look up z equals 1.17 so if we do that here's the 1.1 there's the 07 right so that's how that is and then we're going to go across 1.1 oops stay there so it lines up with the 0.07 and there we go so we have an area equal to 0 0.8790 okay so here's what you need to remember how these Z tables work. We had a normal distribution. We had Z equals 1.17. We got an area of 0 0.8790. So we need to remember that this is the, that goes over here, 0 0.8790. That chart always gives you area to the left. And you guys were very good at this. You remember we do one minus 0.8790 and get a decimal, right? So that's what we're going to do there. Let's see. So I'm getting about 0 0.121. Let me pause for a minute. If you have any questions or if you think you got a different number than me, please let me know. Okay, so no questions. So here's the deal. What do we do with this number? Like, what does this number mean? Did all this work? Like, what is it telling us? Okay, so our p-value is 0.121. So let me explain the meaning of this because I feel like if you understand the meaning of it, you'll know what it is. It'll give you a better sense of how significant tests work. This means if the true proportion of potatoes that have blemishes, that's the word they used in the problem, is 0 0.08. Then there is 
a 12.1% chance of getting a sample in which 9.4% have blemishes. Okay. So I guess my question to you is, do you think that 12.1%, do you think this number, do you think that's a small likelihood or kind of a common likelihood? I guess that's what I want to ask you. So what thoughts do you have there? Think to, you don't have to answer me, just think about it. And then we'll talk about it together. All right, so I don't know about you, but something that happens 12% of the time, that's actually, I think that's fairly common actually. Um, if something was happening like only 2% of the time or 1% of the time, I think I might feel differently. I might be like, okay, that's really rare and surprising. I didn't expect that. But something that happens 12% of the time, I consider that fairly common. Okay. So that's what I would say, that this is a common occurrence. So since it's common, it's common to get a sample where 9.4% is have blemishes, if in fact the true proportion of potatoes that have blemishes is 8%, then that would lead me to believe that the potatoes are probably okay. I would not say to the supplier, send the potato the potatoes back because the sample I got is not very extreme. Even though it's a little bit bigger at 9.4%, that's pretty likely to occur. It ha that'll happen 12% of the time. So since it's pretty likely to occur, I'm not gonna argue with the potato supplier and say, hey, take your potatoes back. They're no good, get them out of here. Nothing like that's gonna happen. That, that's, that's how the statistical reasoning works. Okay, so here's the final sentence we write. Since our p-value is greater than, and it turns out the magic number in statistics is 0.05. So that's not necessarily obvious, but anything that happens less than 5% of the time is considered a rare event. Anything that happens more than that is considered common. Now, you might be thinking, well, Dr. DeMarinus, where does that number come from? Um, it has a long history of being used. Somebody decided a long time ago that this is like the threshold. You could argue with it. You could say, I don't like it, and that's fine. Um, some, some scientists or researchers will use different numbers. They'll say, instead of 0.05, they'll want to use 0.01 because they think something that happens less than 1% of the time is considered rare. There's other people who say, you know, I think you only need to be less than 10%. So there's some debate there. Um, these numbers are all called the alpha level. So the symbol is like, a, it looks like a, a fish kind of alpha, alpha. So the alpha level is like your threshold. In this class, we'll always use um, 5%. Okay, so let's finish our sentence. Since our p-value, which is 0.121, was greater than 0.05, we cannot reject HO. We did not find evidence to suggest we did not find evidence to suggest that the proportion of potatoes with blemishes is greater than um, 
even though our sample was 9.4, again, we showed that was fairly common to observe and it's not really surprising. Therefore, since it's fairly common to observe, I am not going to reject the manufacturer's claim. I'm gonna say eh, the manufacturer's probably right. Probably 8% of them are, are bad or, or less. So I'm not gonna have a big argument with the guy and say, take these potatoes away, I don't like them. Like none of that's gonna happen. Okay, cool. Glad we we did that problem. All right, so uh, let's go back to the document and see what's next. Bear with me while it loads. Okay, so let's see what our what was my next question here. So there was we had a chart there. I put a chart there for you in case you needed it. Oh, I jumped a lot. Sorry, I jumped a significant amount of pages there. That was weird. Okay. Hold on a second. So we tested the potatoes. That's done. This is another proportion test. So we're going to skip that. I'm going to go to this one, which is about filling cola bottles. Okay. So the question here is about well, something that maybe is not too surprising. Who knows? So let's take a look at it. You ready? So filling cola bottles. Bottles of a popular cola are supposed to contain 300 milliliters of cola. That's what they're supposed to do. Okay. So let's go here. It says to us... Um, there is some variation from bottle to bottle because the filling machinery is not perfectly precise. An inspector measures the contents of six randomly selected bottles from a single day's production, and here are the results. Do the data provide convincing evidence that the mean amount of coal in the bottles filled that day differs from the target? Okay. So let's just think about cola companies for a little bit and filling bottles of cola. So it's sort of interesting. It's like, if we just look this up for a second, let me show you something interesting that I find interesting about this, ready? Um, so how many cans of Coke are sold each year? So Coca-Cola, ready? So according to this, how many drinks does Coca-Cola company sells? If this is 1.9 billion servings of our drinks. Oh my gosh, that's a big number. 1.9 billion. So, you know, when I start to think about numbers that big, big, first of all, I'll say this. I don't know if I really have a good sense of how big the number 1 billion is or even 1.9 billion. Uh, it's huge. But just think about this for a second. So 1.9 billion. So I think that's 19,000, 190,000. That's 1,900,000. That's 100. What is that? Uh, it's 19 million, 190 million, million, 1.9 billion. There you go. That's that number. Now, suppose the company is supposed to put 300 milliliters into each bottle. But instead, what they do is they decide that they're going to take they're going to do the following. Just going to make sure I get the same number of zeros there. Times, and they're only going to fill them up to say 295. So they're going to take five milliliters out of every bottle. But the thing is, they get to multiply their savings by 1.9 billion. Let me make sure I get the zeros right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then over here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It looks good. If I hit equals now, right? That is a pretty big number of milliliters to save. <laughs> That's outrageous, actually. So the point I'm making here is that I think a company that makes cola or lots of drinks, they'd be motivated to underfill their bottles. So that's what this question is about. 
because if you know each customer is not going to miss five milliliters of soda in the can but you as the producer of this soda gets to take that five milliliters from 1.9 billion bottles that's unbelievable or servings in this case i know but we'll, we'll just consider this all right so let i'm gonna say this let mu equal the true mean amount of cola per bottle okay and ho is going to be that mu is equal to 300 All right is that what it is is that what the question says yep and ha is going to be what we suspect see like ho is what's supposed to be true so there's supposed to be 300 milliliters per bottle that's what's supposed to happen okay but ha is going to be what we suspect might be true and we think that maybe the company is putting less than 300 milliliters per bottle okay let me pause there any questions so far okay so let me say the following there's something fundamentally different about this question compared to the previous question if you think about the previous question back up here our hypotheses had to do with proportions, right? P was the true proportion of chips that were defective. HO was that 8% or less are defective, which means we have a good batch. HA is we're worried that maybe more than 8% are bad. So in this problem here, the way this is written, we're worried that we're gonna have um, more than 8% be bad. Here, this question is not about proportions. This question is about means. So we call this a one sample um, t-test. We are worried that their, the mean amount of soda per bottle is not what they promised. That's what we're worried about, okay? So that's that. All right. Any questions or comments for me? Yes, no, maybe. So that's going to be the big difference here between the two questions. One's about proportions, one's about means. And so that's what you want to do. I'm thinking about some of the projects we discussed with people earlier. Um, right? Think about the data you're collecting. You're collecting an average number, like a, a number that could, that's a number, like we were talking about before employee satisfaction maybe or morale or how that's ranked in the workplace these are typically done with surveys and the people have scores on their surveys and so forth is that what we're doing here um no slightly different but it's a number it's mean i might have a proportion of questions like for example back to the thing suzanne's working on with the blood vials we could calculate the proportion of blood vials that are underfilled as opposed to compare the mean amount of blood per vials between the nurses and the phlebotomists. So you can do this, you can, she could really answer, your, Suzanne can answer a question two ways. She can do a proportion problem or she can do a problem about means. She could do both. It's, uh, you know, who knows? We'll see, we'll see what's interesting. Okay, so uh, let's continue on with this. So you'll notice that we need like an average from our sample. So this is our sample. What we're gonna do is get an average of these numbers. So to do that, we're gonna add them up and divide by, it looks like six in this case. So give me a second to do that. So we're gonna have 299.4 plus 297.7 plus 301 plus 298.9 plus 300.2 plus 297. And then we're gonna divide that by six and I'm getting an average of 299.03, 299.03. So, and we're gonna give that average a name. We're gonna call it this. So this little X with a bar over it, that's how you read it. You say X bar, but it stands for what it really means is it stands for the sample mean.
the sample mean, if we do the math on that, is 299.03. So that's what we're getting. You'll notice that's a little less than 300, which is what we thought might happen. The question is, is it significantly less than 500 or not? That's what we need to worry about, okay? Is it significantly less than than nine than 300? Okay, so how do we do that? So we're gonna draw what looks like a normal distribution again. That's what we're gonna do. And we're gonna put HO in the middle which was that mu equals 300. And we're gonna mark off our sample mean, which goes out here, X bar, 299.03. And we shade according to HA, whatever HA says. So if we go back up to HA here, you'll notice that HA has the less than symbol in it. So we're gonna shade down here for HA. That's what we're gonna do. And our goal is gonna to be to find this area. That's what we wanna do. We wanna find this area. So to do that, we need a, now you'll notice this is called a Z test, a T test. So I'm just gonna make a slight modification to this question for a moment, just to make our lives easier. Um, you'll see why shortly. So just bear with me for a minute while I do one thing. Um, hold on a second here. For the time being, let's let's do this. I want you to go up next to this question and on your paper, wherever you're writing, right? Assume that the standard deviation is 0.02 milliliters. So that's what I'd like you to do. Assume the standard deviation is 0.02. Um, do I want to do that? 0.02. Let's go 0.2. Sorry. We'll do 0.2 milliliters. Okay. So we're going to do that for a minute because I want to do this as a Z test and we'll switch it to a T test later. You'll see what I mean. So we're going to write Z equals because you need a Z score. And the way Z scores work, it's always X bar minus the mean divided by the standard deviation divided by the square root of n. So this is another formula that we'll just have to know in order to be able to get these questions right. So let's do that. Let's fill in all our information. So we have 299.03 minus 300 over 0.2 divided by the square root of six. Okay, so let's do a little math there. Hold on a minute. So 299.03 minus 300 gives us on the numerator, in the numerator, negative 0.97. And then we're gonna divide it by this thing and this thing. So let me go do that for you. So divide it by 0.2, divided by the square root of six, close, oops. Uh, here we go. So this is actually giving me a z-score of negative 11.9. <laughs> okay. So this is really funny because we have not had in this course the whole time a z-score like this. The z-score is actually pretty crazy. So let me show you what I mean. Uh, if we were to go up here and mark off z equals negative 11.9, and then we went to the chart. So let's go to the chart now, which is over here. And let's go to the negative Z scores. And what you're gonna notice is the following. Okay. What you're gonna notice is, is that the Z score of negative 11.9 equals Z is not even on the chart. The lowest z-score we have is negative 3.09, which corresponds to an area of 0 0.02, 0 0.0002 in the tail. And our z-score of negative 1.9 is below the z-score of, of negative 3.49. So what that means is, is that our area 
is less than this number. That's all we can say is that our area that we want is less than 0 0.0002. So let's go to the, let's go make a note about that. We'll just go to the next page here. And what we can say is, is that our P value is less than 0 0.0002. So I think you will agree that this is very small, very small. And it's very small. And what that means is, is that since it's so small, it's very unlikely. Okay. So here's where we get into the reasoning of significance tests. Since this probability is so small, what we're thinking to ourselves is, this is unlikely. I should not have seen this happen. That's what this is probability is telling us. We should not have seen a sample mean of 299.03. I'm sorry, my screen jumped there. Sorry about that. Here we go. This number, this area is super small. It's less than 0 0.0002 which means that this sample is unlikely. And if this sample is unlikely, that means it shouldn't have happened. So how do we, what do we do? So here's how we conclude. We say the following, since our p-value is less than alpha equals 0.05, we can reject HO in favor of HA. So we're rejecting. I'm sorry, Professor. This is so. This is hole in the high, right? I'm sorry. No, oh, so this is um, the hole in the high. Okay. <laughs> oh. <coughs> I'm sorry, Professor Didier had touched on this rejecting the hole in the high when we had to do for undergrad. Correct. The reason okay. we're rejecting it, so to make it to, I mean, since our p-value is just super, super, super small, because that's what it was, right? It was less, we knew our p-value was less than 0 0.0002. Since it's so small, what that means is it was extremely unlikely for us to observe a sample in which the average amount of cola per bottle was 299.03. And since it's so rare, then what we're going to do is we're going to reject HO in favor of HA. We're saying we're super surprised. We shouldn't have seen this. And therefore, the claim must be wrong. So what we're going to say here is we found evidence to suggest that the amount of cola per bottle is less than 300. So let's go through the reasoning again. So we found evidence to suggest the amount of cola per bottle is less than 300. So that is because we observed something that was super rare. We were super surprised to see an average of 299.03 because we shouldn't have an average that low. That's what this is really saying. We should not have an average that low because it's super unlikely. And therefore, since it's super unlikely, we're going to reject the claim that has been made. The claim is that there's 300 milliliters per bottle. We observe 299.03 and we say, hey, look, that's really rare. It shouldn't happen. You guys must be lying. So that's how it works. Okay. So what we've just done here is we've done two kinds of tests. We've done what's known as a one proportion test, a one proportion Z test here. And we've done something called a one sample Z test. That's what this thing is. It's some, I called it a T test. Uh, we didn't really do that because I used the normal distribution. So I'm just gonna erase that for now. We called it, we did a Z test and the reason we were able to do that is we were given a standard deviation there. Okay, so 
it turns out that if certain conditions are met, that you can always sort of use a Z test, which is, you know, that kind of thing. But I'm skipping that for now. All right. So, any questions or comments for me about these two problems? Okay. So it's 7:45. This is a good time for a quick 15-minute break. So that's what we'll do. We'll be back at eight o'clock. At eight o'clock, what we're going to do is we're going to do tests where we compare two means from two groups. So this will be. You know, Suzanne, thinking about our talk here from earlier. Um, so this is this is for Suzanne. Ready, Suzanne? Here's what we're going to do. I'm not going to write your name. I'm just going to say it this way. We could have the mean amount of blood drawn by nurses, right? And the mean amount of blood drawn by phlebotomists. Now, phlebotomist starts with a pH, right? <laughs> I think it does. So... Am I right about that? Yeah. Mean amount of blood drawn by nurses versus the mean amount of blood drawn by uh, phlebotomists. I can't, so I'm not going to try and spell that. Okay. So what we can do is, is you'll notice that we have two groups, right? So we're comparing means from two different groups. So that's what we're going to do after the break. And then we're also going to do a problem where there's proportions. So we'll do two more types of questions. And at the end of this lesson, then you will know all the different kinds of of tests that you can do okay all right so let's pause now until about 805 and we'll get back together and then we'll finish off um we'll finish off this lesson okay sounds good all right i'll see if regina has to get back in i should be it should come up i should be able to see it anyway so let me stop sharing the screen there and here we go Oh, wait. Yeah. So you guys should be able to see my screen. Okay. Let's get rid of that. Uh, just quick comment. Can people see my screen okay? Yes. Great. Okay, thanks. All right. So I'm going to stick with this example, Suzanne. I'm going to make up some, some numbers on the spot here. <laughs> and we're just going to pretend that they're true and then use that to learn about these two these two sample tests. Okay, so what's happening is fundamentally different now for this second part of our lesson, and then we'll finish up the night, is we're comparing the means from two different groups of people. In this case, if you heard the conversation earlier with Suzanne, we were talking about the mean amount of blood drawn by nurses might be different from the mean amount of blood drawn by phlebotomists. Um, Suzanne, quick question. Did you expect one of these means to be lower than the other? Is that possible or you're not quite sure? Uh, um, we're not quite sure. Right now, the nurses are doing better than the autonomists, and we don't really know why. <laughs> and better meaning that they're less likely to be underfilled. Yes. Okay. All right. So... Based on that comment, so we'll just base it on what we recently are observing. Uh, we think that possibly the mean amount of blood drawn by nurses, that this number on top is going to be higher. That's what we're suspicious of. Okay. So that's going to drive how we write our, our, our hypotheses. So let's go to a new page. And here we go. So HO, our null hypothesis is going to be that mu for the nurses minus mu, which means mean, mean for the phlebotomists is equal to zero. Uh, I want you, this is this is a mathematical idea. And but think about what must be true about two quantities if the difference between them is zero. So we have two means 
and their difference is zero, that's really the same thing as saying that the mean amount of blood drawn by nurses is equal to the mean amount of blood drawn by phlebotomists. Versus HA, uh, based on Suzanne's most recent comment, Suzanne believes that maybe that the mean for the nurses is greater than the mean for the phlebotomists. Okay, we got Regina back, so that's good. Regina, good to have you back. So <clears throat> we think about the order which I subtracted here, right? We're doing the mean for nurses minus the mean for phlebotomists. If the nurses are drawing more blood on average, then we would expect that mean to be bigger. So that's that's what this is. That's what this is really really saying. Okay, so let's um, let's make up some numbers. So Suzanne, I'm going to need a little bit of your help here. Um, how many milliliters are supposed to be in a vial? Um, it should be a minimum of seven. Seven. All right. So we're hoping for seven. So let's pretend the nurses draw an average of I don't know, say. 7.2, and there's a standard deviation for the nurses. So in other words, the nurses vary a little bit. Not every nurse is gonna draw exactly 7.2, giving you the average of 7.2, but maybe the standard deviation for the nurses is like 0.1 milliliters. I bet you it's bigger than that. It's how, hard, how precise could they be? Let's give a standard deviation of say 0.3. And then let's say that the mean amount of blood drawn by the phlebotomist is 7.1, and the standard deviation for the phlebotomists is 0.2 milliliters. So let's talk a little bit about the difference between these two groups. First off, what you'll notice is the nurses um, have a higher average, 7.2, than the phlebotomist, whose average is only 7.1. But if you look at the standard deviation of the nurses, it's 0.3 versus the standard deviation of the phlebotomist is 0.2. Standard deviation measures spread of data. So when I look at this, it seems to be implying that um, the nurses have a little bit more spread, a little bit more variability in their data than the phlebotomists do. Although these numbers seem like they're pretty close together to me. Uh, now, the final thing we need to know is like how many we sampled of each. So the sample size for the number of nurses, let's pretend we had interviewed you know, 110 nurses or we had 110 vials of data. And let's also pretend that for the phlebotomists, we had maybe more, maybe somehow we had 150 data points from the, for the phlebotomist. I'd imagine Suzanne and the data in the back somewhere, this is hiding in there, like the number of people in each group. Okay. All right, so um, what we can do now is, is we can start to uh, make a comparison. So what I'm really interested in is the difference. So the average difference, the difference between the nurses minus the difference between the phlebotomists is 7.2 minus 7.1 or 0.1. So it looks like on average, the nurses, according to this, little piece of data made up by drawing 0.1 more milliliters per sample, like on average. Okay, so what we need to do is find something called a T-score. And the reason we're doing a T-score is the following. Um, these standard deviations you see here, the standard deviation here, and the standard deviation here are sample standard deviations. They base, they're basically saying, um, of the 110 people we looked at, okay, um, of the 110 people we, we looked at, the standard deviation among those 110 people is 0.3 milliliters. We don't know the standard deviation of all nurses all put together and the total population of nurses. So that's why we're doing something called a t-test. Anyway, so we have to create this thing called a t-score and here's what the formula looks like. It's kind of complicated looking actually, but it's just a formula, we just follow it. So it has that on top. On the bottom, it has this, this thing called the square root. And in here, we have the standard deviation of the nurses squared over the sample sizes of the nurses. 
capital N for nurses, plus the standard deviation of the phlebotomists squared divided by the sample size for the phlebotomists. So that looks intimidating for sure. <laughs> there's, there's no doubt about it. So all I, all I can do is apologize for it. I'm sorry that they're, they don't look so good. Okay, so let's plug in everything we have and see what we get. So if we plug on the top, we're at 7.2 minus 7.1. Oops, let me just fix that, sorry. And then on the bottom, we're gonna have the square root of it was 0.3 squared over 110 plus 0.2 squared over 150. So this is going to be a lot to type in our calculators. We just have to take our time and, and slowly get all of this. And then we'll be able to use um, something called the t-test. OK. So here's what's going to happen here. I'm going to try typing this into my calculator for you. So you'll give me a minute. On the top, we obviously have a difference of 0.1. So on the bottom, we need the square root of something. So I'll do the I'll do the inside first. So 0.3 squared divided by 110 plus 0.2 squared divided by 150 gives me this decimal 0 0.0011. Okay, then I need the square root of that. So this ends up being 0.1 on top, and on the bottom we get 0.033. And then if I divide them, so 0.1 divided by 0.033, we end up getting t equals 3.03. .03. Okay. So this is where um, things can vary a little bit. So notice in our case, the sample size for both groups, the sample size in the first group, the N for the nurses was 110, and the N for the phlebotomist was 150. All right, if that's the case, as long as both of these things are greater than 30, then I'm gonna say it's safe to use the Z table, okay? So, that's just a, something, it's an assumption we can do. Uh, I'm not gonna worry too much about the technicalities of it, but that, that's gonna be okay. So let's let's give it a shot now. Let's take this number, which is T equals 3.03. .03. We're gonna treat it as if it were Z equals 3.03. .03. That's what we're gonna do. And we're gonna go to our Z table. Okay. So let's go over here. We're looking for 3.03. .03. So I'm just going to take a screenshot of this and then we'll, we'll use it. Put that into my notes here. Okay. So we're looking for 3.03. .03. So here's, oops, sorry, screen jumped a little bit. That's, there's the 3.0. Let's use red so we can see it. There's 3.0. And then the 03 is up here. So I'll trace this down, I'll trace this across, and we're getting 0.9988. Okay, so let's be careful. I'm gonna go back to my picture here. Now I never really drew a picture, so I need to do that now and understand where this 0.9988 goes, because that's gonna be important. So here's my, my distribution. I'm gonna put HO in the middle which is zero in this case. And I'm gonna mark off the difference, which was X bar nurses minus X bar phlebotomists, which was 0.1. I'm gonna put that out over here. Here's the part that's so interesting to me. Doesn't it seem like 0.1 is really close to zero? It really does. But what's interesting is, is that you know, that's that's what the z-score slash t-score does so what this this thing is doing is it's sort of finding out like is the difference of 0.1 a big one or not because we're dividing it by something called the standard deviation and so that gives you a sense of like 
how many multiples of the spread is our difference. So this difference of 0.1, you'll notice, is almost three times, well, it's three times the size of the standard deviation of 0.033. So while it seems like a small number, it's actually many standard deviations away because these nurses and phlebotomists, the way I've described them, do not have a lot of variability. They have very small standard deviations. They're very precise with their draw amounts. Um, this is the numbers I made up, of course. Suzanne is the expert. We would defer to Suzanne for true numbers here. All right, so let's look at this thing. We get this 0.988. That goes in the table right here on our picture that is 0.988. So there we are. We need this area. So this would be one minus 0.9988 which I believe is 0 0.0012. It's really small. So notice this is very small. Okay, is it less than 5%? It is. So now we're ready to make a conclusion. So here we go. Um, since our p-value is less than alpha equals 0.05, we can reject HO in favor of HA. We have evidence to suggest that the mean amount of blood drawn by nurses is greater than the same, well, I'll just call it mu phlebotomist, the mean amount of blood drawn by phlebotomist. That's what we really just proved here with these hypothetical numbers, which you can say to me, you know, Dr. D, those numbers aren't realistic. And I would have nothing to argue with you about because. You guys would know better than me on that. Okay. But the bottom line is now you know how to do one of these two sample tests where you're comparing the means from two different groups. That's what this whole question was about. Okay. Our final idea for the night is something called a two proportion Z test. In other words, um, comparing, well, you'll see. I'll write it out. You'll see. So here we go. Um, Suzanne, I'm going back to you. The main problem, if you remember, I, I'm going to make sure I understood everything Suzanne told me. When we're going to send these blood tests off to labs, what we're really worried about is that they're underfilled because then it affects the positivity rate as well as certain tests can't be done. Am I correct about that? Yes. Good. All right. So I see I learned. So you can teach me stuff. See? <laughs> You guys can teach me stuff. This is good. All right. So um, let's let's do the following. Let's let um, PN be the proportion of all nurses that underfill. We're just going to, put, going to shorten up the language there. And PB be the proportion of all. I take a minute, take a guess what I'm going to, what I'm going to do there. What do you think? Phlebotomist, right? So PH, I'm going to be able to do it. Phlebotomist, right? The two of all phlebotomists that underfill. That's an intimidating word. Okay. So, I'm sorry. Okay. So that takes care of that. Oop. My, my pen wigged out a little bit. Hold on. So I'm going to write my finger now. Okay. So HO is going to be that those proportions, the proportion of the nurses minus the proportion of a phlebotomist is equal to zero. In other words, there's no difference between those proportions. 
and that phlebotomists and nurses are doing equally well. Okay. Um, versus PN minus PB. Now, in this case, based on your comments earlier, uh, we, we think the nurses are doing better in general. So if the nurses are doing better in general, we'd expect the proportion of nurses that underfill, we think that this first proportion here is gonna be lower. We think it's gonna be lower because they're less likely to underfill. So we're gonna put less than zero here because this number here should be smaller. The nurses are doing a better job. That's what we think recently. That wasn't always true. Okay, so these are hypotheses. Any questions about this? All right, so let's take a look. So the next thing we're going to do now is we're going to start to write out uh, a z-score. So here's how the z-score looks. It looks like z equals. Um, actually, before we can even do that, we need some data. So let's just pretend hypothetically that the proportion of nurses in our sample, let's pretend we interviewed 110 nurses. And I don't know, let's pretend uh, 11 were underfilled, right? And let's do the proportion of phlebotomists. These might be terrible numbers. I'm sorry if they are. Let's pretend that this is like 22 out of 150, okay? So I can divide those. Let me do that for a minute. The first one is just 0.1. This number here, I don't know. So 22 divided by 150. So this is about 0.147. So it looks like the proportion of phlebotomists who, who underfill was a little bit higher. Uh, Suzanne, how scary would numbers like this be in real life? 10% underfilled. <laughs> um, yeah, we'd like it you know, as low as possible, obviously. <laughs> that seems like, I mean, my number they just made up here, this seems like a really high number, 10%, like 10% of the tests can't be done that you collected in the, in the off in the hospital. That'd be bad. It just seems yeah. that way. Okay. So ready? Our Z score then looks like this. So Z equals it's P hat nurses minus P hat phlebotomists. And on the bottom, we have some scary looking things. Here it is. It's the square root of p hat nurse times one minus p hat nurse over the sample size of nurses plus um, p, these are hats, by the way, p hat phlebotomists, one minus p hat phlebotomists over the number of phlebotomists in our sample, okay? So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna type all this in and get a z-score. So here we go. We have z equals, it was 0 0.1 minus 0.417 over the square root, 0 0.1 times 0 0.9 over 110 plus 0.417. I got to do one minus 0.417. So let me do that for you. You get 0.853 over 150. So all of that needs to go into our calculator. Good times, right? So let me do that for you. So we're going to get on top. We're going to have um, Z equals negative 0.047 on the bottom of the square root of that crazy thing. So let me just type that in. 0.1 times 0.9 divided by 110 plus 0.147 times 0.853 divided by 150. And we get 0 0.0017. If I take the square root of that, I get the following. I get negative 0.047. And on the bottom, I have about 0 0.041. Okay. So Z equals, here we go. So that negative 0.047 divided by this number gives us a Z value of negative 1.12. Okay. So notice, um, let's see what we have here. We'll draw our normal distribution. We'll put HO in the middle, which is zero. 
we're going to mark off our difference of, of negative 0.047, which had a Z score of negative 1.12. Okay. So then I'll shade below. Don't forget this whole video has been recorded, so I'll post that link later in the notes for you. And it might take a little time for it to come available, but it'll be there. Okay, so that's what we have. I need this area, which will be our p-value. Let's go back to the chart. So here it is. Hold on a minute. Uh, let's see. Doesn't want to go there for the time being. Bear with me for a second. There we go. Um, we're looking up negative 1.12, right? So here we are. Move this like this. go to our notes we're going to look up negative 1.12 oops sorry about that my bad okay so here we go negative 1.1 1 .1. oh oops, sorry o2 will come down and we get this number 0.1314, it looks like. Okay, now luckily, if you think about our picture, let's see, where did I put it? Picture down here. This is it, 0.1314. And it's already the area to the left, so I have to do one minus stuff. So I'm actually in pretty good shape. We're actually just about done here. So since our p-value is greater than 0 0.05, we cannot reject HO. Uh, Professor, this is Regina. I'm sorry. I have a medical cab coming for me. Um, you're recording this, right? I am, yep. So I'll be posted okay, up soon. And I'll, okay, and I'll reach out to you via email or I'll, um, so we can talk over the phone. You got it, no problem. Okay, thank you. All right, take care. Good night. Good night. And good, okay, so you're ready? So since our p-value is less than 0.05, we cannot reject HO. All right, so what does that mean? It means that there's not a significant difference in the proportion of nurses that are underfilling versus the proportion of phlebotomists that are underfilling. Um, this is sort of interesting, actually. So if you were to put these two problems together, you'd, you'd learn something interesting. So in the first case, we proved that the nurses were definitely drawing more blood on average than the phlebotomists were. That's what we proved. When we compared the means, we got a significant difference in favor of the, the, the nurses. The nurses were drawing more. However, when we looked at this data that I made up when it came for just underfilling, the proportion of times that they underfill, According to this, there's not a significant difference in the proportion of times that they underfill. So something to keep in mind. Anyway, um, that's that for tonight. So that would conclude our lesson. Do you have any questions about the math we learned tonight? All right, so I'm gonna stop recording this now. Um,